Yeah, it's is this the bridge. Um, I think it's the other side over there. Oh, it's on this one. This one. Oh, oops. Can't see that one. Yeah. It's a program that sends Americans all over the world for about two years. Sorry. Sorry. That'll be interesting. What do you see? Uh, it's just Is a it bug. a rat? No, it's just a bug. Oh, no, that's fine. No, I thought it was a rat because it could happen and I was going to like freak out. You know what's funny about South Africa though? It's like, like you said, it only goes according to planet. Oof. Nothing ever goes according to plan. <laughs> Never. Ooh. We're not going to be able to do our, um, our interview with the power job. How are you going to cook if the power job? Oh, shit. Peace Corps is, I would say at the basic level, Peace Corps sends Americans to other countries to help with um, projects or teaching or just help communities to improve their way of living. I joined Peace Corps because um, I wanted to help people in some way, and I also wanted to get experience internationally. Uh, I was hoping to go to Uganda. Um, my first choice um, in terms of region was Africa, but specifically I wanted to go to Uganda. Um, I was still excited. I didn't know that much about South Africa, but I was still pretty excited. I was kind of surprised with how developed everything was. But yeah, it was kind of weird to just like get off, get on a plane in America and fly for however many hours and then land in Africa and seem like you're in America still. <laughs> Even when I first found out I was coming to South Africa, the reaction by some people are like, oh, we didn't know that they, why would they have Peace Corps in South Africa? Not only are we dealing with similar development issues that other volunteers might face, but we're also dealing with knowing that there is, is money, there are resources in this country, and they're not equally distributed by any means. And we can see it on it. We see it. And when we go to Pretoria, when we go to the cities, we actually feel it, and there are days when you know, I'm in Pretoria, I could start off, if I'm at a mall or I'm, you know, in a private taxi or I'm having a great meal, and that same day I could be back here in my community to have that in one day. At first it was really difficult just wrapping your mind around it. And how can people be okay with that? Maybe if the HIV rate wasn't the highest in the world, 
Maybe if the youth unemployment wasn't so high, maybe if rape wasn't such a big issue, maybe we wouldn't be here, you know? And it kind of feels wrong having to justify us being here by giving all of those statistics, but, you know, there are problems here. What you see here is all the development, and that's it. So now, as far as you look to the left, as far as you look to the right, it's protected, there's no, I love it, no development. You know, Peace Corps markets, like any marketing firm, they're gonna give an ideal version of what Peace Corps is like, so that's why you see the pictures of digging a well out in the middle of nowhere and happy people all around you rejoicing at what you're doing. But it's so difficult to put a common stamp on Peace Corps because it's true, the saying, every experience is different. And I've observed here in South Africa, just one country, that there is a huge difference in your experience from one town to another town. And it's things that you can't anticipate. I'm living now in paradise. The, the world has changed since 1961. The communication is different. The access to um, uh, the internet, which makes the world, uh, we can all communicate well. Uh, most of the volunteers now have Blackberries. Has anybody ever told you that it's like Posh Corps or anything like that? Only once. They'll never make that mistake again. Uh, I was in Pretoria at, at Peace Corps and it was somebody from, they went from South Africa, of course, because nobody in South Africa will say this is Posh Corps. What's Posh Corps? Posh Corps is what um, Peace Corps volunteers made from other countries or even Peace Corps volunteers that in South, within South Africa or within, within, a, within a country um, that's what they call the volunteers who have more access to first world amenities. I have two really big sinks out, right outside of my door. Um, and I actually have running hot water from one of them, which is kind of unheard of in um, Peace Corps. I do have a flushing toilet. Yeah, I actually, I literally have my own, I have my own bathroom. It has a flush toilet, it has a bathtub, and it even has like a, a sink. I, I mean, I'm actually sweeping the ants out of my bathroom before I have to take a bath. And they just swarm everywhere. Um, I was actually saying how I think they're really resilient and that kind of embodies like these core. <laughs> no matter how many times, I keep, I keep trying to keep them out of my house and they keep finding new ways in. I would definitely say that this, this is not your parents' Peace Corps anymore. It's really different. You have internet, you have computers, you have electricity. Like, um, the problems the world is facing now isn't necessarily the same ones they're facing in the 50s and, you know, I mean in the 60s and 70s, you know. Now it's, it's like we said, it's about resource allocation. Um, but there's still a need for diplomacy and sharing American culture. Just because you have cell phones doesn't mean that you don't, you don't need those things. They think that just because we have like Pretoria and Cape Town at our disposal and that some of our sites have like running water or whatever, we have nice, like we live with host families that have nice things, that it's easy, you know, and that like we don't struggle, but that's not true. Okay, do you have that? <laughs> So calling it posh core, I think is really, can be very ignorant. This country, are you, am I allowed to say vulgar words? This country is a mindfuck, right? It's like a total mindfuck. <laughs> it like just messes with your head. So I just think it's a silly thing for people to say. And I get really annoyed when people say it because they don't know. For me, like I, I studied Swahili in college and I knew that I wanted to work in Africa and I always thought that I was going to be Can Kenya and Tanzania and I was kind of bummed when I found out it was South Africa. South Africa just never was appealing to me. It's good? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, it's good. But after being in the country and talking to people about other countries in Africa, like, this seems like a great place to start and kind of keep some meat on my bones and make decisions and plot and do things that way.
I knew I was going to love whatever was going to come across my eyes, and so whatever came into South Africa, I just decided to love. is called Mabalani Village. It's I'm still not sure how many people, but they estimate like 5,000. <laughs> it's pretty, um, it's kind of spread out, I think. Um, and there's no like structures like a clinic or a community center or a library or anything like that. We have a few organizations and then um, a lot of churches and then that's about it. <laughs> okay, so I'll just start here and then wrap around. But this is where I've stayed during my Peace Corps service. Um, over here is the garage where we usually store drinking water and things. Um, this is where I do laundry and then hang them. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I definitely feel like a different person in the village. It's definitely it's a more relaxed feeling that I have. Um, just because it feels like home at this point. And then this is my uh, my room right here. Living in this house, I like it. I like having the big windows and just like having a lot of air coming through and it's just like a lot of space. This, I don't know how big it is, but it's it's probably not that much space to other people, but <laughs> but like compared to other volunteers, it's like a big room. So my role in the village is uh, I'm assigned to an organization called Hiri Suinwe Batahala organization, and they run six projects throughout the village. Um, I primarily work with the home-based care, um, drop-in center, and then occasionally do stuff with the victim empowerment project. For me, like the thing that I do as a volunteer is just like trying to start projects that will benefit the community and that they can get involved in and interested in. So this is a, a mural that I did, me and the kids did after an anti-bullying sessions that um, we did for a week. Yeah, so for the anti-bullying campaign, we did uh, a few sessions at the drop-in center, which was just like teaching kids what bullying is. Um, and then after that, the kids came up with rules, uh, things like no hitting and no throwing rocks. Um, no swearing, no calling people bad names. And like their signature of the contract that they would agree to the rules of the contract were putting their handprints on the wall in the form of a peace sign. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, when she came with this idea, uh, I took it uh, so light. <laughs> but uh, after uh, what she have done here, uh, we have seen a, a huge change on children, on children's behavior. They are not bullying each other, they are not fighting. Uh, they, are, they, they are working as a team. They are living like uh, brothers and sisters. What I can uh, say is that uh, she left a mark on us and we were still expecting more from her. And her leaving, it will be a wound into our hearts, but we don't have choice. It left a mark that uh, America is a very helpful country, a country that uh, doesn't want other people, that doesn't want to seeing other people suffering. Uh, they are friendly and so lovely. I can tell you, like during the first, like I said, the first year, the first six months or so at site. It was, like I said, difficult of getting them to realize that I was an American because I was black, but also it was difficult to prove to them that I could do the work as well as a white person could because like they would say things like, oh, Veronica, don't think like a black person, think like a white person, as if some like someone else would say like, oh, the early bird gets the worm. It was just like a saying that they had. <laughs> but like I tried to explain to them, and I think, I hope I got it across to them of just like, why as black people themselves and just like talking to another black person they 
shouldn't say something like that and shouldn't think like that. Um, but every now and then something like that will come out of someone's mouth at work will be like, oh, we need a white person to come and do this so they can do it right or something like that. And I'm just like, please don't, please don't say that. And what is the thing you will miss most when Veronica leaves? Very easy to sing when I'm going to miss us and then it'll be a good family. So they are saying that they, they will miss uh, her love, her support, because they know that in terms of conflict, when they fail to handle conflict, they will call Veronica and help them. Uh, they were taking her like, the, like their sister, like they, they were family, in fact. <laughs> so hey, it will be hard for them when she's gone because they were used to her. Do you, do you hope that she can come back one day? Very much now, I love Angawa. Yeah, they say uh, they wish if she can come, even when she, she, she is going back, they, they, they are not interested. If it is it was their will, they will say uh, she must stay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's incredibly difficult for someone my age to join Peace Corps. I was in a job that I didn't really like. Um, I was making money, but I didn't feel like I was doing anything meaningful. So I could just stay at my job and make money and spend it on things I don't really care about. Um, or do this. So I joke it's my midlife crisis, but it's not really. It was just something I wanted to do. And the timing was such that... Um, you know, I, I asked the question, if not now, when? Uh, when I first came here, the first week I was here, uh, Peace Corps ha held a permagardening workshop. And it was for, uh, it was held here, but it was for the Peace Corps volunteers in the area. I've had, the, the only training I've had in gardening was the permagardening workshop. My background is, is tech, but the point I think that should be made is that uh, where I'm hoping Peace Corps remains flexible in letting volunteers have some autonomy because even though I'm a tech guy with a tech background, I can spend, and I don't mind, that's what I'm here for, I'll, I'll help out any way, but there's interest and so for me that's opportunity and they've taken it. And if you look out there, we've got stuff growing all over the place. So again, my background is tech, um, and, but there was an opportunity here with the, with the gardening there was interest, people took off, so I went there, that's where I went. And um, uh, I don't know how you fit that in a, uh, how you explain that to a, a volunteer when they first come to a site and they're looking for what to do. Um, my suggestion is you kind of have to just be an opportunist and see where you can, where you can help out. Um, so that's the biggest challenge, that what you think you're going to do, um, you're not going to do, or likely you're not going to do, and then you're going to get to a site and there's going to be other things, that, other factors in there that are just going to prevent you from doing what you think you, you were going to do. Um, so that, that's very frustrating. I don't know how Peace Corps, in their defense, I don't know how they can prep you for that. I don't know. I think South Africa was particularly difficult um, as a location for a number of reasons. Yes, there are a lot of nice things, but you don't have any money, so you can't do these things. So the person you're working with is driving a BMW, and you are not. So there's this disconnect. You know, you're given 80 rand a day, that's your allowance. You know, to put it in perspective, that's about uh, $10 a day to live on. So, um, yeah, you see all this stuff, uh, but you don't get to experience it. I actually, one time I did my laundry, I was in Hainisa. I did my laundry, put it on the clothesline to dry. The woman that comes to the house didn't like how I did my laundry, took it all down, washed it, put it back up, charged me 30 rand. <laughs> I'm just getting into the groove now. Uh, here's what is going to happen. I'm working with sixth and seventh graders, 
and the lab I work with, we have 20 computers. And the goal is uh, to get them some basic typing skills, and by the end of September, they'll be able to research and write a paper. Today, what I want you to do is I want you to practice typing. So those of you with the typing game, I want you to practice a little bit. And then, yes, you can go back to Encarta, okay? Absolutely, I do talk differently, and what you do, I mean, you know, you know exactly, yeah, you hit it. Um, you, you become, first of all, you start limiting your words, so you use less words. Have any of you done the typing game yet? Do you know what the typing game is? Do you understand any words coming out of my mouth? Now, yes, now I know your village voice, and yes, we all do it. If you're a Peace Corps volunteer, you and I will be having a conversation, someone will come in who, who's... English is a second language and you talk differently, yes, the village voice. When you're a teacher in South Africa, there's no room for compromise. I mean, I, I think I was, I had some level of preparedness, but I don't think you can ever truthfully be prepared to teach here, coming from the United States. Um, Lily told you your, your class are going to be overcrowded. I just didn't expect there to be not enough furniture. Um, I mean, the first like few days of class, my, like you know, half my kids were standing because there weren't enough desks. I don't have textbooks for my learners, and I just have to I have to write stuff on the board. They have to copy it, and it's a waste of time. But yeah, it's it's just stuff like that you don't think about. You take for granted in American classrooms, but they just don't have those materials here. Okay, the second part, activity four, activity five. I'm going to explain them now again. Okay, do you know how to do a line graph? Okay, let's let's revise it then. So here we have we have months and we have numbers, then. Okay. The numbers are going to represent how many cows a man has. We, like in, in my school, we have third world materials. We're working with third world materials. We got chalkboard and chalk, and that, that's pretty much all we got. But the curriculum, or what they might want us to teach these kids, or the workbooks they might give us if we do have workbooks, it's the demands are first world, and I feel like the conditions on the ground are still third world. How many from seventy until you live in a third world place, but then you know you get a call from the office and you have to go into Pretoria. It's only two hours away. You go two hours from where I am, and you're living in like a bustling metropolis that has first world everything. But then as a Peace Corps volunteer, then you go back to your village. And that's... I've heard that that's one of the most difficult parts of being in South Africa as a volunteer is um, having the mental toughness to be able to withstand that constant switch from living in the third world, going to the first world, and going back to the third world again. Mm -hmm. My village. Uh, the predominant culture in my village is uh, Ndebele, um, but it's Kwanabele is this whole area is kind of weird because there was this whole homelands act thing where they kind of moved all the different tribes to different places, and um, they moved the Ndebeles to this area. Mm, that nice, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very nice. Mm. Yeah, very nice. So if I was going to get married, I would wear this yeah. also. So put it that side. This thing, it's a sign. From the Ndebeles, I don't know what I can explain, but it's our traditional Ndebeles when the boys are coming from the mountain. Oh, so this is this is Ndebeles, yeah, not Sutu. Yeah, no, this is Ndebele. Ndebele. Yeah. So yeah. my family is Ndebele and Sutu. Yeah, eh? yeah. I feel like Ndebeles are they're a little more traditional. I think I just thought Ndebeles are are they're they're really 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 proud of their culture, but I can't say if that's specifically a specifically a Ndebele thing, because I've only lived in the Ndebele village. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, these are definitely the belly colors. I know, yeah, I know these colors. No problem. Yeah. So very in the belly colors. Hey. I think. Uh, I think. Gibona omushle ne. Yeah. Mouth koge ganze omushle. Then tate. Atate lez tombelezi. Ayova komba zona es America. Guti ena es South Africa. Bega sheli ganjani. Ufunde i nu chaji. So si happy ukuba na ego le female nu chaji. But uyofunda. More, more Okay. Thank you, George. Uh, <laughs> manga. Peace Corps has made me a better person. I can already tell. Um, I'm just more patient. And it's made me... I, I feel like what Peace Corps does, and this is why I think a lot of people fail in Peace Corps, is because they come to Peace Corps, like I said, running away from something. The thing about Peace Corps is that it exposes all your weaknesses. It was funny though, when my girlfriend and my friends come to visit in September, right? They said so they're going to visit. My girlfriend speaks Chinese and my friends speak Chinese. <laughs> so they know how to speak Chinese. They, they know how to speak Chinese. You don't, you don't, you know. I'm not Chinese, man. So I don't know how to speak Chinese. Hmm. I don't speak Chinese. So my friends, they speak Chinese. Uh, so you're, you're going to enjoy it, man. Yeah, you're yeah, yeah. Ching Chong. No, yeah, it's not even a word, I want man. them to speak their in People are going to be like, ah. This guy, you are the Chinese. <laughs> That's the problem. If I'm hanging out with my Chinese friends, we're like, ah, you, when I, when I, I know. When I, I know. You're Chinese, you've been lying. Yeah, Spoo. Spoo Siso, yeah. Spoo uh, Siso is probably my, one of my best friends here in South Africa. He's just a really like laid back guy, but he's a super serious teacher. And I really like I like Spusiso because he kind of took me under his wing when I got here, and he really made an effort to be my friend. I really think when you're te when you're teaching in Peace Corps, or especially in South Africa, like you do have to steal your heart a little bit, because otherwise you're just gonna bleed out. You you have to wear like emotional armor. I think otherwise it's just too much heartbreak. I give my students a practice test, and a lot of them failed it, and some of it's my fault. Um, I overemphasized some things that were not that I felt were really important, but weren't emphasized on the work schedule, and that's totally on me. And it feels really bad right now. And that's what's tough. <laughs> so even the one that you trust that is going to pass, it doesn't didn't get didn't perform. No, I mean the the, the one I trust to pass there. They, they, they passed or just almost passed, okay. so it's okay, but I mean, I don't know, I just thought it would be better, I thought it would be better, so, I don't know, I thought it would be better. Basically, I'm asking him, like, how can I get my math scores higher, because I was, maybe, I graded a small sample size of them, but they weren't really that good, and he says he gives them a lot more homework than I, than I give them, but I gave my kids homework at the beginning, they just didn't do it. So I, I'm not really, uh, I'm not sure if that's going to work. Yeah, like I feel like I failed those kids today. Like I really do. I have to, I learned my lesson now. I have to follow the work schedule probably. I think these kids failed because I messed up. Anyway. Okay, thanks. They, they always tell you this in training and everything. They say, you know, you know as long as you get to know, or as long as you know, you, like, you know, two or three kids get it, like, you know, then you made a difference, you know? Or, you know, as you know, as long as that one kid, you know, can use the past tense afterwards, or, you know, these kids, they finally understand their multiplication tables, and, you know, even if you were doing it for two years, it's worth it. I want to do better than that. And it's not working out so far. <laughs> I, I, I just, I can't accept mediocrity. I can't do it. I want all my kids to pass. And I don't know how I'm going to do that yet.
Um, so I live in the village of Halambani. So the first day I arrived was with my principal. I knew that I hit Peace Corps jackpot. Like it was just this cool sense of feeling that like I'd found a place or I'd been put in a place by Peace Corps that would work for me and that I'd be able to do cool things. Yeah, so it was pure excitement when I came here. And then we parked the car at the school and I, I met my host mom and then afterwards we walked up to the, the house and I was like, it was the first feeling of disappointment because I was like, oh man, like my house is really nice. Like I'm not going to be like that stereotypical Peace Corps volunteer. But then I like met my family and we spent the, the, the night and we had some dinner together and it was just, I knew it was going to be cool. Yeah. Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Bless us, Lord, in these thy gifts which we are about to receive through thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Venda is it's a language spoken by less than a million people spread throughout uh, southern Zimbabwe and northern Limpopo. They they still have their own way of like eating, their own way of kind of designing things, living in a certain way. Uh, um, and they've never really had to, to sell who they are. They just have been who they are. But in South Africa as a whole, it's one of the only countries where you can go and poop in a pit latrine and then be in a mall and buy a pair of Nikes in the same day within a respectable amount of time. Um, I think for some people it becomes this crippling crutch that, you know, it's whenever I'm stressed, I just need to treat myself and I go into town. And so they kind of avoid what's going to keep them feeling connected in Peace Corps, which is staying in village, being integrated into the community. Yeah, this is South Africa. Like you can go to Menland Mall, Brooklyn Mall, and like be in these nice situations, but like your work is in the village. That's what our agreement is. And that's what's going to kind of keep you happy. Like we know it's going to keep you happy. Yeah. Uh, maybe three hours in the Okay. Three hours. So it takes about three hours to cut down a tree like this. Okay, what? Mara, Nido, it takes a. Hey. Hey. Mara, you adore Or a drug, eh? Hey, this is more expensive. Yeah. Hey, you know hey. He was saying this this wood is used mostly for like basic items like spoons and cooking utensils and it's like a softer wood. And then this inner wood is used more for like mutoli, the thing that we saw him building. He was kind of carving the inside. So Oh okay. Yeah. This morning we were at Eric Lambani's house. Um, he is a, a local artist. And he just has these really hard woods that grow throughout Venda. He cuts down the trees and turns them into um, items like canes for, for priests in the area. He turns them into like little sculptures of like kids that become like ornaments for yards. And um, we've been working on trying to get some funding for him to expand a, an arts and crafts program for local kids to kind of teach them the, the ancient Venda ways of doing wood carving. Yeah. So they also make the, the, he also makes little bones for like the Sangoma when they put it in a, and then you, you do my foot. Hey! Show me the phone, I 
He was first discussing about like having coming from God and like God put the, the message on his tongue and when he threw the bones he learned different things and this bone talks about being careful about African magic and that some people have a lot of jealousy and they will try to blind you on your way but you have to keep like finding your way um, don't let people be jealous and and there's good people too that like like him and his wife that aren't here to fight <laughs> There's so much as Americans that we don't see, that we don't experience. Peace Corps creates this bizarre productive bubble for Americans to go abroad, like do things that are that help communities at the same time help America, but putting Americans in other people's shoes, I think is our real goal. Like putting Americans in shoes of people in other countries because we have such a big impact on the rest of the world. Uh, so my family is Filipino. I don't know how many Asian parents share with their kids their experiences living in poverty. For my parents, my parents saw it as like we immigrated out of poverty to get you into a world that's like developed so you can live comfortably. Like why are you going back to poverty? <laughs> I wanted to see how the rest of the world lived. I knew I wasn't going to make a huge difference. I knew I wasn't going to change a village. I knew I wasn't going to build an orphanage. But I knew that I needed to grow and I needed to see how the rest of the world lived and I needed to be grateful for what I had. And I got exactly that. I came, that's what I came here for and I, that's exactly what I got. Lehonyani, it's a village that's three hours outside of the, the capital, Pretoria. You know, I, in my opinion, the people who stay here have a real shot at getting a bursary and moving out of this area and moving into the city. That's how I feel about Lehonyani, and that's why I feel so strongly about making a difference here and building those relationships, because I really think that these kids are brilliant and they, their English is very good, and they can, they could climb the social ladder. Oh, I made a mistake here, sorry guys. Throughout the day, um, I do my lesson and then also prepare for my girls club meeting. So I have girls club twice a week. I'll do my girls club. Usually it consists of games and then a topic and just talking about life. I just knew that the pregnancy rate in these areas are really high and I also saw that like the super bright ones in these classes were girls but I also knew they were really at risk because even though they're bright it doesn't mean that they won't be sexually active when they're 12. So I wanted to reach them at a really young age and start talking to them really early on about um, you know setting their goals and objectives and not being distracted by boys. What about, do you guys know Michelle Obama? Yes! Is she a leader? Yes. Is she in a position where people have to look up to her? 
Does that make her a leader? Yeah. Okay. I'm just really worried that they're gonna get pregnant at a really young age. I don't think they're gonna get pregnant, but I, I kind of think they might get pregnant. I mean, it's just so common here, and it's so like in your face, and it's not like they have role models all the time to tell them that like that 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 can seriously ruin their chances. Because these girls are so smart, if they had the right foundation and right people to p continuously push them, they could be doctors or whatever they want to be, they could do that. But I don't, if they get pregnant, they're just not going to have that option. Mm -hmm. so, what does it take to be a good leader? To be loyal, responsible, and kind. Okay, loyal, responsible, and kind. Do you guys think that's true? I am Lisa Ratswani. My position in Girls Club is as a president. I have to make sure that the Girls Club is in order, there's no fighting, people respect each other, and no bullying to the little sisters. They told us that she was Francis Nana Diego, but in South Africa her name is Olivia Classy. She told us to be loyal, to never underestimate each other, never to undermine each other, never take somebody for granted, because you'll never know what she's capable of as a girl or as a woman. Respect, Nick. What's one of the rules of our club? Respect. Okay, so do you guys think all of these qualities are... I just want to say that Boys must never underestimate girls. Whenever boys tell them that girls can't do this, girls can't play rugby, girls can't do this, we must just shut them down and tell, tell them that it is possible. When I was, when I was younger, um, I was really picked on. Did you know that? Yeah, when I was really young, when I was in your age, I was picked on by people and people would talk to me that way and then they would make me feel small or left out. And so I was like you, I was I would cry sometimes, you know, by myself because it's very it's very hurtful. Uh, the president at my primary school, um, the president is Losejo. Uh, one of my girl one of the girls, Katie Metsi, who's another one of the girls that I am very close to, they're just having problems. I guess Kitty Metsi doesn't want her to be friends with Teboko, so she just always makes Lasejo feel bad whenever Lasejo says something. She like gives her a look. Hmm. Well, there you go. There you go. You'll be okay, Lasejo. I know it seems like a very, very big deal right now, and it's very scary. But I promise, if you stay strong through this, when you're older, you won't even think about it anymore. It breaks my heart. It makes me so sad. I, I, it makes me really sad whenever they cry because I remember how hard that is to like have people pick on you or just not fit in or just be fighting with a friend. And just, you know, continue to be yourself and don't let them make you feel small. Because I said, oh, you're not small. Think about all the cool stuff that you did today. You led this whole meeting, you know, by yourself. You're president of the council. You're smart. So don't let the way somebody treats you make you feel small, okay? Just let her have her space. Kate and Betsy will come around. She'll grow. She's still growing too, okay? Okay. All right? You'll be okay? Thanks for calling me this holiday. <laughs> so nobody's gonna replace Olivia in my heart. Nobody is. She tells us what's right and what's wrong. To me, she's like my own mother, but <laughs> not really my own like. My second mother. Yeah. I think it's harder to be a female Peace Corps volunteer here than it is to be a male Peace Corps volunteer here. I think there's a lot of restrictions placed on us because we're women and a lot more dangers. Like if you ever go anywhere, guys are always hustling you, even in your village. Everyone is, you know, catcalling you, but that happens everywhere in the world. But I think here it's just there, there's that extra element of like, if I don't shut this down immediately, it might lead to something more and then it, he could rape me, <laughs> you know? And that's just because of all the statistics and people, PCVs who've gotten raped and stuff. That's not even like a subconscious thing. I mean, every time I hear about 
another one of my friends like getting assaulted I'm just like you know every time I walk around I'm like you know like really jumpy I wasn't like that when I came here it's crazy when you're here for two years and you can see like another person's growth I'm sure they look at me and they're like wow she's changed a lot like when I first came here I was like what like cheers and doing dances with them and like playing games all the time and really idealistic and I just wonder like if the kids have seen the change in terms of like me becoming more realistic I think there's so I do think that there's a lot of potential here for like volunteers to really make a difference the frustrating thing about South Africa is that there is money here and there's so much potential and there is like a working economy to a degree. But I think volunteers need to know what's going on. Like I think they really need to know beforehand what the what what they're getting themselves into, I guess. I would tell them to be ready for challenges, like mental challenges and I would tell them to be ready for for people to just expect you to do things and to figure out how you want to approach people who have that attitude towards you and to know that just because people aren't saying thank you, it doesn't mean you shouldn't still help. That's what I would say. I feel like it's um, a very typical response to say, you know, I, I joined Peace Corps to change the world. The main reason I wanted to join Peace Corps was I wanted to be in a different culture because I wanted to try and see things differently. That was one of the big motivations. I, I wanted to learn another language. I wanted to feel really uncomfortable. I think there's something so beautiful and, and human and real about the Zulus singing and dancing and the life behind that. I would love to bring that back. Um, I've been able to go to a few ceremonies and participate in some really wonderful activities with the dancing. Weenin or Vinin is Afrikaans for the place of weeping. Officially became a town in 1841 when the Afrikaans came to this place after many women and children and were brutally killed by the Zulus in an agreement that went bad. So they were weeping, came coming to this place and started all different kinds of Farming in this area, it's really great farming land. But of course, there were Zulu people living here. 
it's been said that, you know, apartheid really was like, birthed in this area. So there's just a lot of a lot of history, a lot of hatred in this place of weeping. But you could drive through Wienan and not really, you know, see a white person. Um, I also, I guess I saw my role here as bridging these two worlds. Some people is used to them, if you talk about uh, HIV. Some, yes, they understand, especially the elderly. You see, the grown-up people, they say, oh, fuck, you are wasting your time. I've got my, uh, my, 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 my wife and uh, I made so many kids. You come and tell me about HIV now. Uh, no, that's nonsense. Go to the youngsters. So yesterday morning, we were in an area called Gugla. So we met with the Yanduna there to have a focus group meeting with him and some of the men who attended our event in November. An event where the Induna trained men about HIV and AIDS transmission, prevention, condom use, HIV testing, and medical male circumcision mostly. You see, in our own culture, we always feel the responsibility of teaching the boys to the Baba. Mm. When it comes to girls, we feel that mother is going to, you know, mm. bring the girls up. So it's, I cannot, as a father, and bring my daughter to come and sit here and say, look, my daughter, this is how I want you to... Uh, no, it's impossible. He seems like a natural-born leader, and I just think that it's fantastic that he has been chosen as an Induna in the area. He can communicate well with different types of people and holds this authority, but not in a powerful way, where I've seen some other leaders get obsessed with the power. So I've been really happy to work with him with this HIV education and information, which can be a sensitive topic, especially as a young female talking to an elder male about these things. You don't have to, if you don't want to tell us about testing or MMC, that's fine. But have you had any conversations from, from that meeting maybe with your family or any other men? What have you done since that meeting with the information you learned? I think it's a really complicated and complex history. You have to understand the history to understand how and why things are the way they are. For 50 years, you had a government that had an education system that was oppressing people. In this area in particular, the Zulus were evicted from their land. So they had their land, their homes, and their livestock taken away from them. So you look at all those things and you can understand, you begin to understand where the people are coming from, which I think you need to have understanding coming into these communities and working here. You have to. So maybe you can talk to one of the counselors and yeah. see if they'd be willing to yeah. do that. Wonderful. Um, also, what I wanted to say is that I'm leaving South Africa in a few weeks. I'm really? finished, yeah. Yeah. I've been here for three years now, but I'll miss, I'll it's miss been this so place. It's so nice working with you, mm. really. I'm Liz. And I'm Hazel. And we're the Stanleys. <laughs> <laughs> I met Les and Hazel Stanley after about being here for four or five months. So they were doing some outreach work in the community, doing English education on a Friday afternoon at their home. They have a training center. And it was so amazing because they've worked in KwaZulu-Natal their whole lives. They're South African. They've worked in education and in rural areas. So they, sh they shared a lot of the same frustrations that I shared. We went to friends for supper. And they had told us that they had discovered this young white girl living in Stenden. And yes, I remember very clearly meeting her and immediately thinking, wow, she must have something very special. Especially in an area that just has this incredible history of hatred. And here's this young girl in Stenden. We were amazed. You know, for the people, 
because I believe that also brings healing amongst even the white people here when they see what she's done. People who wouldn't even drive, white people wouldn't drive into Stenden because you know you don't drive in there, it's too dangerous. And there's this young girl living there and suddenly people are going in there because they're seeing, you know, it's actually okay. These people are fine. Okay. So let's pretend the water is the male sex fluid, okay? And the male is HIV positive. If he's wearing a condom, the fluid goes into whatever the vehicle that has been used, whether it was the HIV, whether it's the computer courses that they offer. The most important thing that she's given many of the young folk here is a hope. And she's, she's enabled them and she's actually empowered them to be catalysts for change. So you, exactly, you pinch this so that no air can enter. So follow me, okay? Okay. It's inside out, see? Okay, no, very good, very good. Now, can he or someone else explain how does this protect you from HIV? Kanjan, how? I would just like to say thank you to Peace Corps for what has been done in the country. And, and yeah, and just say a very special thank you for Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just, Ryan is just so special to us and um, yeah, she's been like a daughter to us and we're going to miss her incredibly. For so long we're here and we feel like we're not making any progress. We feel like we're not having any impact or influence over the people we're working with. It's not often you get people that say, hey, thanks for doing this, or you helped me with this. And that's not why you do it, but every once in a while you need that encouragement. So even just the past few weeks when I've started to tell people I'm leaving and to, to ha hear their reactions or to you know s see them feel saddened by it, it's comforting in some way as strange as that might sound, because it kind of feels like, oh, well, you did know that I was here. You did recognize that I was at least trying. You know, I might not have done everything you had wanted, but I at least I really cared and I tried really hard. So to finally feel like noticed, I guess, it means a lot because it's really hard to keep going when you feel like no one even cares that you're here. And for a while, it feels like that. And I think you come in as a volunteer wanting to see these huge changes, but also knowing that sometimes it's in the small things. Those are where the miracles are. It's not this big idea that we have of changing the world. It starts with each and every one of us, and it's, it's very small, but those are the big things. So I think we have to also change the way we view success. There were a lot of like other volunteers in my cohort that started like months and months ago packing up and I started like 
not that long ago, <laughs> like doing the bulk of it this week. And so that's been just a hectic thing of um, sorting through things, giving away like clothes and things I didn't want. <laughs> I think they realize I'm going, but they don't know I'm not coming back. <laughs> no, because even like adults in my family or like neighbors had come up to me this week and just like, oh, I didn't even realize that you would like ever leave type thing. And I was just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Remember me from the farewell party. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and then a lot of people, I know this has been described, used to describe it like other South Africans, but I know especially a lot of people at my organization, they're like very stoic and not, they won't like break down and cry or like I didn't expect anyone to break down and cry or anything like that. I've definitely felt not as emotional or like, yeah, I guess emotional as other volunteers. So like I'll talk to other people that, other volunteers in my group and they're just like very sad and they're like, I'm crying every day. And this, and it's just like, I cried a little bit yesterday, but it, I don't know if it has hit me yet. And so like, yes, there are times like when I, I'm lying in bed and I like think like, should I, I feel like I, like I feel like a bad person because I'm not an emotional <laughs> having the full two years of just like all the interactions all the experiences it's how it's changed me and like I'm glad that I just did the two years because of that and like learned from my organization for the whole two years and continue to work with them for this entire two years because I felt like having that whole time period was important um, to me. Yeah. I don't know, I, I guess I would describe coming back as kind of overwhelming and underwhelming at the same time. Um, I mean, because there are like adjustments that you need to make and, and just like getting used to like how you lived before and just like reconnecting with friends and family um, is a big thing. But also you realize that just like people have been here living their lives for those two years as well. And it's just like yeah. interesting and weird to just like come back and see that your friends have changed and like, oh yeah, they were living for two years too. <laughs> I'm definitely glad to be back. I, I don't know if I miss South Africa. I definitely miss the people that like I worked with and like I lived around in my village. And then every now and then there are things that I miss of just like, um, actually like taxis for some reason. I kind of miss them. <laughs> um, how, is, how is it going? Um, it's all right. It's stressful as well. <laughs> um, just to not have your own space and yeah, it's hard to be twenty living with your parents <laughs> in your twenties living with your parents. But I mean, it was it's it's good to like be here and just like also spend time with them since I've been gone too. Oh, okay. Yes. I'll fix you some. Okay. <laughs> as as I continued to go through P 
Peace Corps, I, I, I quickly started to realize that this is like purely dependent on the individual. And it's like a very individual experience. You can let other volunteers and other elements impact you, but at the end of the day, like it's really a matter of you. And so, yeah, my opinion changed from it being this like Americans abroad to like Sean abroad, like Sean the American abroad. So we're gonna read a story and I want you guys to look for the uncountable ones, okay? Winnie the Pooh went round to his friend Christopher Robin. I wonder if you got a balloon, he said. What do you want a balloon for? Do we see any uncountable nouns? Any countable, uncountable nouns? There's this perception about Americans being aggressive and it's just in general not understanding the rest of the world. And I think that's reflected in our, in our TV, it's reflected in our politics, it's reflected in... A, a lot of elements of our culture. But I think if we had this massive amount of people that got exposed to Peace Corps and they did it in a good, good, like, strong manner, I think it would, it would cause a, a general change in a lot of those, those layers of our culture. It, the change that happens within the individuals is immeasurable for, like, I don't know, just for the benefit of the social benefit in the States. I would maintain that even a bad Peace Corps volunteer is still good for America. And I mean that by, even if you have a volunteer that, let's say you had one that wasn't good, he, he liked to party or he didn't go to school as much, he's still a human being. He's seen as, he may, they, may, they may look at him as, you know, he wasn't helpful or this or that, but he's not going to be viewed as evil. To hate America, you kind of have to demonize people, right? That's how things, bad things happen. So it'd be hard to demonize even the worst Peace Corps volunteer. You might say, oh, they're silly or they didn't do what they were supposed to do, but we're not evil. I'm really hoping that one of my girls, like one day, will be like president of South Africa and would be like, I had a PCV who was a teacher, you know, and she changed my mind about my capacity. All right, okay, listen up, what Personally, I feel very fulfilled. I feel like I've grown and these people have affected me hugely. And in that, I'm very grateful for this, for this opportunity. You got a lot today. We have come into a community where people, people didn't think that America cared about them at all. And we have come and dedicated two years of our lives to show that not only do we care about what's happening with the rest of the world and what's happening with them on a personal level, but that we're just like them. But she makes it perfectly, hey, I won't, I won't make it so good as her. No, just, just go to her and ask her. The then recipe? Yeah, then, mm. then she'll write down for mm. you. Then you'll, pre you'll prepare it for yourself. Mm. You see, then you start another piece in the mm. <laughs> I don't think Americans want to eat this. That's why this is important. And it's, it is important, you know. And it is important even in the sense that the government wants us wants Peace Corps to be that branch that's like, look, we are helping the world because America needs that image. <laughs> we can't just be seen as warmongers all the time. That's not going to help us. As I said, it's, it's hard letting go of projects. It's been really hard to come to with terms that I'm leaving here after three years. And that's something I'm personally dealing with. But to know that there is another, another volunteer coming that's hopefully going to pick up where I left off. Yeah, yeah. Hello. This is an amazing place. It's been challenging beyond belief, but it's a beautiful place. The people are so welcoming. So I think the volunteer will will do wonderful things, and I can't wait to see what happens. I think maybe Monday, maybe by three or four. If you want to come with me here, um, 
I have some books for the volunteer, and I just want to make sure everything's set up nicely. So when she comes Tuesday, it's okay. Learning about the relationships has been a big part of this experience, and um, how people are really all that we have, and we get so caught up in so many other worldly things um, that we forget that. Kifuna, Nike, Ama books, and yeah. to make it oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think we make things more complicated than they are in America, and um, there's an obsession of make of our time being so valuable, but. I question, what are we doing with our time? If you're not using that extra time to really spend it with the people that you care about or to add real depth and value to your life, you know, is it a good thing? Uh, gosh, I was just looking at this up yesterday. I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of at a, there's, they call it peaks and valleys, is what they call it. And, um, the Peace Corps staff, the medical staff, actually gives you like this graph, this this, this graph, and it's like all about um, all about your ups and your downs during your service, and it's really <laughs> accurate. <laughs> and uh, right now, I'm I'm kind of in a, a downturn currently. Um, I don't really know what it is. I don't know why Peace Corps does it to you. It, I think because maybe you don't have any control sometimes when you're in Peace Corps, and um, that can be really difficult for some people. And you know, mentally, gosh, I mean, I I, I teach a lot of classes. And so I'm in front of a class, you know, four out of six periods of the day, and sometimes after school, and sometimes on the weekends. So it um, gets kind of tiring. Um, and then emotionally, it's like I said, just the rug gets pulled out from under you a lot more here than, or a lot more during your service than you would expect. But you just gotta deal with it. You gotta roll with it. <laughs> That's the only way you can make it. You gotta laugh like I'm doing now. <laughs> on sour cream walls, Donations. Shakespeare's head, cloudless at dawn. I, it sounds awful, but you you can't be too empathetic. Like there there really are some students, and I'm sure it's the same way in the states. They're just not gonna listen to you, and um, it's really sad. Not like, you'll try your best, and I have tried my best. Um, but if they don't come to school, I'm not sure what I can do. This map becomes their window and these windows that shut upon their lives like catacombs. Break, oh, break open till they break the town and show the children green fields and make their world run azure on gold sands and let their tongues run naked into books, the white and green leaves open. History is theirs whose language is the sun. Oh gosh, I love that. I love that grade 12 poetry class. Um, yeah, so once a week, usually on Thursdays, I'll meet with some of the grade 12 students who are going to be taking their exam at the end of the year. Yeah, I, I, I really enjoy it and I think it keeps me a little sane, maybe. Yeah. Like, what do you think that means to, to be like paper? To be like paper. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. Paper is thin. He, this boy, he is like paper. You, 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 you can just rip him. He's, he's so, he's so thin. You know, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm a science person, like, you know, like, I want to see statistics. That's also what DC wants to see, too. They want to see statistics. Um, you know, you reach X amount of youth, you know, the, 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 the passing level went from here to here. Um, but that's not really what I think is important. Like, I think it's important to make friends and have people remember you. What you're doing is you're not so much building something, you're, you're building relationships with people. And that's really what Peace Corps South Africa is about. Building relationships with people and hopefully um, gradually making a change. None of these boys, none of them are good. But then, now tell me about learner number four. He's just learning things. Yeah. Not even contributing on what the um, is happening. Like, he's not even there. Yeah, that's right, because it says that his eyes live in a dream, a squirrel's dream in the tree room other than this. So maybe he's sitting there, but he's, he's looking out the window. But the other thing is that it says he's sweet and young, which means that all these other children, they are broken. But this one, he's still, he's still strong, but he's just looking outside. 
these rest of these children, they are broken, but he's, maybe you can help him. So that's why I said, is there any mention of hope on question one? And I think this boy, maybe he has hope. 